please welcome filmmaker Jennifer Lee. I first started making this in 2004. I was working at Technicolor Digital Intermediates and um, I w as an editor, and I had. Yeah, oh, right there. there we it, go. It, I was working at Technicolor uh, Digital Intermediates in 2004, and I s made this most of this film while I was working full time there. But I had watched Meet the Press in 2004, and I it was about Roe versus Wade and overturning Roe versus Wade, and I'm a feminist, so I was watching this, and everyone at the table was a man, and they were all discussing how this was going to happen. And I thought, why are there no women at this table? So I went to work the next day, and there was this woman editor working with me, and I said, you're not gonna believe what I saw last night, and I told her about it, and she said, well, are you a feminist? <laughs> and, I, and this guy started walking down the hall, and I said, well, yes, I am. And I thought, well, maybe these two things go together. Why are we whispering this word feminist? And I just watched this thing on television, and it's been about 40 years since the women's liberation movement, and we're whispering the word feminist. <laughs> so I thought, I got to tell her, I got to tell her why it's good to be called a feminist. And I couldn't think of anything. And so I called my mom, and I said, tell me one thing, one thing of what it was like before the women's liberation movement. And she said, well, I remember having to look in the female help wanted section of the classified ads in the newspaper. And I said, oh, I sort of remember that. And I thought, I shouldn't sort of remember that. I should know that. And it started me on this journey. And it was like finding breadcrumbs throughout the country. And I started to Google some people, and I said, well, would you be interested? And, and I, I took women who were significant, who did significant work during this movement. It was a movement that was huge, and it, went, it seeped into every corner of our lives. Really, there was nobody in the country who could ignore the women's liberation movement. And I had a lot of challenges. I had my husband shoot a lot of interviews, and when he couldn't shoot and he was working, I had friends shoot. I shot on weekends. I took red eyes across the country. And I knew that there hadn't been a film on the women's liberation movement, and I knew how long it had been since the women's liberation movement. And I've been looking for another film to make. I've been working in the industry for a long time since I graduated college, which was in the 80s. And I'd made one documentary film, and I did that sort of the right way, which is I got a grant, I hired a crew, I went somewhere for a couple of weeks, and we shot. And this was done a lot differently. And I felt the need to do this because I've been considered myself a feminist since I was 10 years old. And I was confronted with this reality that I really didn't know the details of the feminist revolution. And that took me into many different parts of my life of what I'm working on right now. And I can get into that after I show this clip. There's this about eight minutes. I picked some of the funny stuff in the film, although I use a device in the film that I was a little reluctant to use. And I put myself in it telling my story. And I kind of just did it dead on. <laughs> and I did that because I raised some final funds on Kickstarter. And when I showed some friends of mine this little clip, they loved it. And when I started to you know, after I got the money and I started to finish it up, they said, well, well, where were you? How come you're not in it? And I said, well, I was probably just gonna do a voiceover. They're like, no, no, no. And so I started, you know, looking around more social networking and I thought, you know what, I think this is the right way to go because film has really been revolutionized by the net. And that brings me to two things. One, the film brought me to Pakistan. I was invited to show this film in Islamabad and that flipped me out too. And my husband and my mother are saying, you have to go. And I'm thinking, I don't really want to go, but I have to go, I don't want to go. And I was like really back and forth on it. And so I called the embassy and I said, look, I'm coming there. And they're like, great, we'll come by. <laughs> I'm like, all right, I'm going. So I went and it was an amazing experience and I'm going back and I'm gonna shoot a film there. Awesome. And the third thing I wanted to talk about after we see the clip is that so many of our industries, from publishing to um, movies and newspapers, have been revolutionized by the internet. And now theaters are going to start to go. And it's just my prediction on things, because theaters are so locked in to Hollywood studio films. And right now, I'm a part of Tug. 
and getting the film shown in theaters, in people's communities. And I'm really excited about this idea um, because it really brings a lot of these industries back to people driving stories. So. All right. Even though feminists were dealing with very serious issues, they used their sense of humor a lot. I was an activism junkie. I had come from the civil rights movement and the new left, and I still had that sort of leftist, yippee, let's do something about it, let's just not sit and talk which was kind of, I think, a reflection of the male politics of the time. They said we were just women sitting and talking. I wanted a little male approval. And we formed this little activist group, and I came up with which. And the anagram was Women's International Terrorist Conspiracy from Hell. Ma'am, what is the uh, organization WITCH here? The initials WITCH stand for the Women's International Terrorist Conspiracy from Hell. It's the striking arm of the women's liberation movement. Now, what are you seeking to liberate? I didn't hear the question, I'm sorry. What are you seeking to liberate? We're trying to liberate women from the kinds of stereotyped roles that they've been put in by the society. We demonstrated in front of the stock exchange and meanwhile came by at 4 o'clock in the morning and poured crazy glue in the locks and then came back at 9 a.m. and cast spells and hexes. And of course the doors, which at that point had real locks and were these huge brass doors, wouldn't open because the, so it looked as if the hex were made lots of headlines. At that point, the media was already saying, feminists have no sense of humor. They loved us and we were able to get our message across. Well, it took off so much that there began to be little witch covens that sprang up all around the country, completely unconnected to us. They used the anagram differently. There was a, a group of women who did a wildcat strike at the telephone company, and their group was called Witch, Women Incensed at Telephone Company Harassment. The witches materialize at demonstrations. They perform guerrilla theater. They emerge just to harass. New York radical women decided to make an action to protest the Miss America pageant to protest women being judged by beauty exclusively. Girls from each of the states parade before a capacity crowd at the Atlantic City Auditorium. And we all climbed into the buses and we sang all the way and we got to Atlantic City. We started demonstrating. Number one piece of pride in American property. She sings in the kitchen, hums at the time. It was such a nexus of sexism, obviously, objectification, racism. At that point, there had never been a black Miss America. It was commercialism, obviously, because she shilled products. And it was militarism, because Miss America always is sent to wherever the troops are. And they were yelling at us, the men, oh, none of you could be Miss Beauty Queen, you were ugly. And there were really some beautiful women there, so come on. Four or five women went in ladies' drag. In other words, little skirts and little gloves, and we bought them tickets, and they went inside. The pageant, you have to understand, was live. Meanwhile, Miss West Virginia is rounding those last curves to capture... They were in the balcony, and they had secreted under their coats panels which said nothing but women's liberation. They unfurled the banner over the balcony, and, of course, all the cameras... <laughs> and then they went to commercial and the women were arrested and carted off. We couldn't get a permit to have a fire on the boardwalk, so instead we had a freedom trash can. We never did burn bras, but our intention was to burn bras, to tell you the truth.
before 1970, the ideas that Betty Friedan talked about in the feminine mystique and the ideas we talked about in women's liberation, we knew we could hit a chord and get a response, but there wasn't a national explosion. And the breadth of the movement was clear once the women's strike was called. And Betty Friedan was telling everybody 50,000 were going to march, how we're going to make it happen. So if we're going to make a statement, let, let, let's make a big one. Let's take over the Statue of Liberty. And they measured the wind factor at the top of the statue. And they went into someone's loft and they made two 40-foot banners. The one at the bottom was going to say March on August the 26th. And the one at the top was going to say Women of the World Unite. I said, how are we going to get this over the, on the boat? And they said, well, we're going to cut it in pieces and put grommets on it. And then we're going to wrap each piece around a woman's body and put a maternity blouse on her. So sure enough, when we got there, they took the guys on the side, the guards, and they were talking. We ran up the stairs while the women downstairs were preparing to do the demonstration when the signs went up. We barely got in because the guards caught on and they started chasing us and we were slamming the door trying to keep them while we put the sign out. And then the mayor called. It was Mayor Lindsay. And he said, let the women alone. That picture of the Statue of Liberty, Women of the World Unite, went around the world. So showing this in Islamabad, I showed it at three different universities and the women were amazed and they said that they thought that they had no idea that American women had fought so hard. The, the film is put together in sections, so I do a section on why I started the film, what life was like before the women's liberation movement. Then it goes into the Presidential Status of Women Commission, which did the study on what women's lives were like, and it radicalized the women in the US government because they had no idea there was so much poverty and that women weren't even being called to juries and things like that. And then it goes into the feminine mystique. I interviewed Betty Friedan, I did her last interview. And then I got into the civil rights movement because so many of the women who went down to the, for the summer of 64 went back to their universities and really were confronted with a lot of sexism. There was also a lot of sexism during the civil rights movement where the women who were working in there weren't really allowed to talk. It was mostly the men who would get up and talk. And so some of these issues were being raised and there was a lot of conflict around that. And then it goes into some of the later events of what was happening with black women's liberation and some of the clashes there, the formation of NOW, which the original board of directors for NOW um, had both black women, white women, and a nun, and a monsignor on the board. So it, it's really pretty amazing when you, you we, we have so many ideas about what feminists did back then, and there were a lot of myths, and one of the myths that I kind of wanted to grapple with with this early women's movement and I thought to myself as I was shooting it, it's like, oh, I'm going to have to deal with this racism issue because, you know, I've been hearing that, you know, the women's liberation movement was so racist and you start to dive into some of this. There were black women all over the place dealing with these issues, writing pamphlets, handing the pamphlets out on the streets because that's how information got disseminated then. And so I do talk to some of the women about these issues in the film. And then towards the end, I just went up to 1970. I definitely shot a lot more, but I had to end it at 1970 because I had to stop working on this film and move on to something else. And I shot a lot of the interviews before I became a parent, and I knew that my daughter was going to be coming along. And I thought, well, OK, I'll shoot all these interviews, and then when she's napping and stuff, I'll edit. But when she napped, I napped. So <laughs> my editing time just became a couple of hours each evening, and I went on like that for a long time. And so you know, it was an adventure, and it was me and 
Final Cut Pro and um, learning about the women's liberation movement. And now um, I'm doing a lot more work on women's representation in politics and how I'm seeing that representation that this facts about women's lack of representation, that, that we are just low people on the totem pole worldwide. Um, there's more and more on in the movie industry and, and female characters in films. And just recently, I mean, just this summer blockbusters, it's mostly male buddy films. And it's very, very difficult to really raise a daughter in a country where there's really not many female politicians. You know, what movies am I going to take her to? Um, even voices on the radio, there's statistics about that, that women are not called as experts when um, anchors call people, you know, for what do you think about this? And, you know, the scientists and the politicians, it's usually men. In fact, it, we're, we're under 20% and across the board and almost everything. And this is an area I'm really interested in. Wow. Jennifer Lee, everybody.